bloody tight he showed up. There's no being named Ragnarok. Right? Ragnarok isn't like a, a speaking figure. It's it's the event. It's the war at the end. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm a specialist in Old Norse language and mythology, and today I'm reacting to God of War Ragnarok. Who are you? Who you seek? It's never stated actually what kind of being he is. He may not even be a conventional Jotun, but he will show up at Ragnarok with a flaming sword, which may be the sword that's still glowing from the forge is kind of a shout out to. He will be one of the leaders of the enemies of the gods, will have a fight with the god Freyr and kill him. And then once all the gods are killed, he will set fire to what's left of the realms and everything will burn up. So what's the point of all this? You keep separate from Sinmara just so you can sit here and wait to die? Okay, hold on. Because the Sinmara name has come up again. I just want to see if I can figure out where this is coming from real quick. But I'm looking for obscure stuff. Uh, here's another book endorsement. Rudy C. Mix, uh, Dictionary of Northern Mythology. He he tracks down all the obscure stuff. Okay, here we go. Sinmara, the female companion of the giant sorter in Fjolsven's Mall. Very obscure poem. It's just stated to be his wife. Heart. She's got mine. I knew it had to come from somewhere, and of course, it is an extremely obscure source, an extremely obscure name that they're making a lot of hay out of. But this whole thing about her heart and her having a lot to do with Ragnarok is uh, pretty much out of whole cloth. I should note that if I have a hard time figuring out what you're talking about, you are using really, really obscure references. Part of what happens is there's so many, dozens and hundreds of names mentioned in these poems and so little is said about any but like 20 of them so what ends up happening is such a weird superstructure of speculation gets built on top of these names that nothing is said about in the original sources that people who don't know the original sources assume that must be there and then i kind of get the well you idiot why don't you know more about this it's like well because it's not actually there right it's not actually seen, like i can't remember all 500 or whatever names that are in there So, here it is. The spark of the world. Oh, this is beautiful. Muspelheim is a fiery realm from the creation myth. So it does pre-exist the realm that we live on. So what happens in the creation myth is that there's a watery realm, Nibelhammer, and then there's a fiery realm, Muspelhammer. Water flows out of Nibelhammer into the cold void between them and freezes, but then flame from Muspelheimer melts the ice and the first living being drifts out of the ice. So Muspelheimer is is there at the beginning. Sorter is somehow associated with the realm Muspelheimer. He may be from there, whatever it means to be from there when it's kind of the primordial place. And then sparks from Muspelheimer are used to create uh, the stars, the sun, and the moon. But that doesn't seem to be the context here of like spark of the world. Kiala horn. That is the horn of Heimdallr. Horn, obviously is the same word in Old Norse and English, it's horn. Kiala is kind of interesting because you could read it as something like yeller, like it's the yeller horn, the loud horn maybe, but a somewhat more interesting interpretation would actually take it as the horn of the river Kjol, which is the river of hell. So almost so as though it were the horn that summons the hordes of hell or perhaps that sends people to hell or something like that. But yeah, Heimdallr will blow it to signify that Ragnarok has begun. My bloody time he showed up. There's no being named Ragnarok. Right? Ragnarok isn't like a, a speaking figure. It's it's the event, right? It's it's the war at the end. He's a, a huge figure in Ragnarok, but to say that, remember that the main story of Ragnarok is half of 63 stanzas, right? So it's not like we get tons of detail about anybody. And by the way, what it means, Rok is uh, is like events, and Ragna is the is a possessive form of another word for gods. So you notice there's a lot of words for god, Asir, Bos being one of them, but Ragna, Rok, you notice how that alliterates? Like this is something you pick up on in Old Norse fast as they like to alliterate. So it's, it's the events of the gods, with events, Rok often having a pretty negative connotation, so roughly fates of the gods. You. You. 
never shut up! Odin is a shape changer, sort of. Odin seems to have this ability to make you not recognize him. Not like not that he's really changed shape. You know, he's depicted as an old man with a long gray beard and one eye, and he like disguises himself as an old man with a long gray beard and one eye. So it's it's not it's not like much of a shape changing, but it, it's almost like he has this ability to just make you not realize who he is. So him disguising himself as or like concealing his identity behind that of another god isn't utterly absurd, but it doesn't happen. Part of what might be inspiring that is there's this very prevalent idea on the internet that Tyr is the real head of the Pantheon. What underlies that is pretty thin and in a sense linguistic, which of course I like language, but there's limits to what it can do for us. Tyr's name, if you roll it back, is the same word. It comes from the same Proto-Indo-European ancestral word as Zeus. So you could infer that once he had a more Zeus-like role in the Pantheon. But it's also possible that he didn't. <laughs> you know, could Tyr once have been a more major figure in the Pantheon than he is? Yeah. Is he in the sources that we actually have? No. Nope. But I imagine that maybe Odin disguising himself as Tyr is semi-inspired by that notion that Odin somewhere took over as the chief of the Pantheon. No. I didn't want this. So Thor is Odin's son. They fight alongside one another at Ragnarok. In the story in our medieval sources, Odin is killed by Fenrir the wolf, and Thor is killed by the Midgard serpent. They never physically fight. Certainly Odin never kills Thor. So this is just, again, utterly out of full cloth. Their personalities are in conflict. They're very different personalities. Right, Odin is this schemer, this gambler, kind of a behind the scenes manipulator. Thor is an out in the front, straight up honest, you know, fighting man. And in fact, we have a poem in the Poetic Edda called Horbarsljöð, the song of Greybeard, where Thor meets his father Odin. And when Odin doesn't want to be recognized, no one recognizes him. Odin gives his name as Horbar, the Greybeard, and they exchange insults. Thor never quite realizing that he's talking to his dad, but Odin insulting Thor and Thor kind of not quite realizing he's insulting Odin. So their personalities are definitely in conflict. I am not sure that you ever see Thor obey Odin in a meaningful way. It's not that kind of father-son relationship. And Odin's not, you know, he's not a boss of the gods, but he certainly is not in a violent relationship with other gods. This doesn't sit with their characters to me. They might squabble, that would be realistic enough, but for Odin to kill Thor, like I don't even understand what the point is. You have no hold on me anymore. And that's my friend. I forgot how good you look with wings. You know, even with some major figures, so many gods and and everybody else have different names that it's not entirely clear that Frigg and Freya aren't the same person. Occasionally, they're definitely presented as different, like in the poem Locusena, where Loki insults the different gods and goddesses. The defining thing about Frigg is that she's Odin's wife and Baldur's mother. So if they're kind of treating it as like what Odin calls Freya, it's not an abuse to the sources. It's kind of an interesting use of, of the confusion between the two of them. Much like Odin fighting Thor, there's no scene of her fighting Odin. Her having wings, though, does have some textual basis. I think I mentioned before something called a feather cape or, or falcon suit that she wears. Actually, it's very confused whether it's Freya or Freya, or again, if it's the same person. Sofna, Apfra, Desu. Sofna. Somewhat superficial note, I'm struck by Odin's costume a little bit. You know, I'm a I'm a ring guy myself, I guess, but boy, Odin has a lot of bling on his fingers. This scene doesn't have any bearing on anything that's in our, our sources. Loki says Sofna up Fratesu. So Sofna is to go to sleep. I guess he probably means to say like go to sleep. This is like to go to sleep up from this. I don't know what the intention is. Go to sleep starting now, maybe? Because the next thing he says is Sovna Hedon, which would mean to go to sleep from here. So I guess he, probably what he's trying to say is like, go to sleep now, I guess. It is difficult to translate words like soul and spirit into Old Norse. They 
have a very limited notion of a sentient being being separate from a body. There is a concept called Hugar, H-U-G-R, which is maybe kind of like a soul, where a magic user can send his or her Hugar into another animal. But then while that Hugar, that animating force, the spirit, if you will, is in the animal, the wizard is in a coma, basically. That's about the most separate that the soul gets from the body in Norse sources. So souls or spirits being separate from the body to me is is, a, is pretty foreign from the, the general gist of how, if you will, animacy works in Old Norse. I just don't even know how I would necessarily talk about that in Old Norse. It's Ragnarok. He's here. He is a fairly important figure in Ragnarok, but he fights Sorter, who will kill him with his flaming sword. It's interesting that Raya calls him Ingvi here, which is another name of prayer. So we're, we've got that multiple name thing going again. He says to her, Nod, I think is the word that he's meant to be saying, which is grace or mercy. I don't know what the context of that is, if he's sort of cursing <laughs> or if he's telling her this is a mercy or something like that. I, I don't know how to take that. I feel like Ragnarok is maybe not handled in a way that evokes the spirit or the feel of the original very well to me. There are elements that I like, you know, visually this setting with the enormous cliffs of Osgarther is, is really cool and compelling and, and different from the kind of more cosmic setting that I feel like pop culture or, or the Marvel movies often give this stuff. I, I like the the physicality, the kind of earthiness of the setting. They've changed so much of who's alive and who's not alive, why people are doing things, that it's just not the same story at all. If I had you read the Poetic Edda, there would not be a lot of spoiler alerts if you then went and played this game, because it's the, the sequence of events is so different. Not quite at the level of, you remember the Super Mario Brothers movie from like 1993? Uh -huh. Plumbers! No, he is. I'm just apprenticing. Right, where it's clearly not meant to be about, like, this is a script that wasn't about the Mario Brothers, but they got kind of jammed into. Like, it's not that much of a difference, but there's a pretty big difference from the original source material here. And if you like that video, why not check out Jackson reacting to and explaining more scenes from God of War Ragnarok.